experiences, either at a scout camp or a high adventure camp. And I, and I did that this, uh, this last summer. I asked the 12 and 13 year olds, uh, you know, we, we get around and, and, and share a campfire, and usually there's some sort of little presentation with the boys. So I asked them, I said, tell me something, these are 12 and 13 year olds, tell me something about the Constitution. Tell me something about our founding uh, as a nation. Tell me something about why it is that we have our system of government. And what do you think I heard? Crickets. We got heard nothing. I heard crickets. That's it. And so I told them, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sitting on a uh, pop drop because I'm uh, it's got a, a throat thing going on here. Um, I told them about our founding and about our constitution. And I know I'm talking to the choir, I'm preaching to the choir here because that's what the Federal Society is all about. Um, but I was shocked by the fact that they didn't know really anything at all about how it is that we became a nation, how it is that we then get our system of government. I then went a month later with a group of 16 to 17 year olds, I think high school juniors and seniors, uh, and I asked them the same question. And in response, it was a little bit better, it was like, well, doesn't George Washington have something to do with this? And <laughs> look at that thing going on with the, the, like England, right? Or was it somewhere in Europe? You know, very sketchy, you know, very sketchy at that point. And uh, it was a very, sad commentary really on what's happening in our public school system. I mean, we're not getting this foundational, fundamental understanding of who we are as a country. And the reason that's a problem is because, and I told these young men, the reason that you're gonna go sleep tonight with a full stomach, and we're gonna get in a car, and we're gonna get on a nice freeway, and we're gonna get back to Las Vegas in five hours on an interstate freeway system, and we're gonna get home, and we're gonna be safe, and we're gonna tuck you into bed, and you're gonna get up, and you go to school the next morning, and you're gonna have the opportunities to get education, and opportunities to go and uh, 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 prosper with a family, and, and live out your dreams because of our country, our system of government. There is another system of government right across from the Rio Grande. And in that system of government, the people there are doing everything they can to get over here. Why? Why is it that our system, why is it that we as people enjoy this prosperity and these blessings and these opportunities? Is it because we're smarter than our, than our southern neighbors? Is it because we've got better resources? Is it because we're just more morally superior? Of course not. A, a, a river separates those two countries. How about in Egypt? And how about in Israel? They share a border. Israel's got one of the highest uh, per capita incomes in the world, one of the most prosperous nations and economies in the world. And in Egypt, you're trying to live on two bucks a day, at best. Why is that? And they had no idea that the reason is because of our system of government. That's why. We have a different system of government in those two places that share borders. And it happens all across the world. So, as we'll as talk about today, fundamentally, at its core, what is the state with this litigation? And what's going to happen in this term of the U.S. Supreme Court, we're going for all arguments at the end of next month, is going to be ultimately our system of government. It is our system of government that's at stake here. And we'll kind of walk through this. Um, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a historical perspective, just to kind of put this all uh, uh, in, in perspective. Here. And you all know this. You're all, you're all students of, uh, of history. Um, we had uh, some, some colonists who weren't happy with uh, a company called the uh, East India uh, company was bringing in, go ahead, do it on that slide. The East India Company was bringing in uh, tea to the Boston Harbor, and uh, they decided that uh, they had had enough about the, of this monopoly, this, this company that England said was gonna bring all their tea over to them, and they about had it now with getting more taxes put on this tea, because they didn't have, well, no, anybody in Parliament representing them, and so they said, this is, of course is a taxation without representation. They didn't uh, you know, dump 342 chests of of uh, tea in the Boston Harbor, 46 tons of uh, tea, enough to keep uh, the, the, the colonists in that area drinking tea every, tea every man, woman, child for a year. It was a ton of tea. Uh, and that's what started our, our you know, spark a lot, you know, what we are now. Well, in response to that, the parliament had, had enough of these, you know, these rebels, these, these colonists who thought that they needed self-government. And so they, 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 they uh, initiated, remember this, from your history, these intolerable uh, acts. When they were going to shut down the Boston Harbor, the Boston uh, Port Act, they, were, they took over literally the Massachusetts government. If there was a British uh, subject that uh, was going to be tried, they'd send it back to England because they didn't think they had uh, a fair shot within the colonies, the Administration of Justice Act. And of course, the Quarrying Act, which, which led to one of our uh, amendments to our Constitution, where, hey, if, uh, if a soldier needs to be quartered, you're going to get quartered if you're a colonist. In response to that, in response to those intolerable acts, the colonists got together and they created the First Continental Congress. And they said, we're going to create a Continental Association 
and we are going to boycott all British goods coming to the colonies until these intolerable acts are repealed. And uh, they said that's going to hurt. That's going to hurt England because about 35, 40 percent of England's production was being exported to the colonies at the time. King Henry, or King George, sorry, King George the Third didn't like that. Major economic blow to England. He went to his attorney, called a solicitor general then, and he said, can the, can the colonists can't do this. The colonists can't boycott our products. We're gonna, I bet we're gonna pass a law that's gonna force these colonists to buy our products, <laughs> to buy the British goods. And the US Solicitor General said, they are well within their rights legally, and we have no authority to force those colonists, our subjects, to buy anything. Now, we fast forward to 2010. <laughs> the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act would do to us as Americans what King George and the Parliament did not do to us when we were their subjects. They forced us to buy a product for the first time in our history. So I'm going to focus on that. that, that that's the individual mandate. I'll talk kind of about on the peripheries about what uh, other kind of uh, considerations are going on, but that's but that's the heart of it. And as you know, it's 2,400 pages, massive bill. We'll talk about it in just a minute. Remember, Nancy Pelosi was saying we got to pass the bill before we know what's in the bill. And the last couple of weeks, we've seen a few things that are in the bill that have got some people upset with First Amendment considerations. We could have another seminar on that. But a lot of senators, of course, signed on to this, not knowing what was in the bill. Now they're feigning, you know, surprised by the fact that their First Amendment uh, uh, rights are being assaulted. No Judiciary Committee review. Remember, they couldn't do that. They couldn't send it to the Senate or the House and, and have their committee review it for constitutionality. It ran, ran through, compels us to buy a product, as well know. Within hours, 14 states challenge. Florida leads and, uh, and, and ensues in Florida State Court, Pensacola Division, uh, before Judge Vinson. And when you go home tonight and you say your prayers, you'll, you'll understand why I to say this. But you thank our Father in Heaven for Judge Vincent. <laughs> you just thank him. I'm just telling you, it's one of the people you need to thank tonight. All right. Um, 25 cases have actually challenged uh, the law nationally on various grounds. Uh, some, some, some religiously based. Uh, most of them uh, are based on, uh, on the individual mandate. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the individual mandate, like I said, and talk about that for, uh, for uh, just the next few minutes. All right, so let me just talk about where we are uh, in the courts of appeal. Uh, let's talk something about this, but you can see, uh, this is kind of a nice graph, but you can see who the appointed judges are uh, and, and, and what the rulings have been. So the, the, the Sixth Circuit is weighed in. You can see the Sixth Circuit uh, was made up at the time of two Republicans and a Democrat on, on, on the, uh, the oral argument panel, and, uh, and the, 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 the law was upheld. It was upheld at the, uh, at the district court level by a Democrat appointed a district court judge. And then two Republicans on the court of appeals level were part of that panel. And they upheld the law as well. Judge Sett said, uh, you know, not every intrusive law is unconstitutionally intrusive law. I'll go into the analysis here in just a minute. Um, kind of by way of example on, on what most of these uh, courts did. This lesson, we're going to talk about uh, Gladys uh, Kessler, uh, district court of Columbia. I'll give you an interesting quote from her. So she, she again upheld the law. The DC Circuit, again with two Republicans. A Democrat upheld the law as well. And uh, it was actually Judge uh, Silverman, you may recall, he's typically a pretty conservative judge. Uh, he said, uh, it seems that this is really more of a political judgment than it is uh, anything that's uh, going to have a problem with constitutional limitations. Fourth Circuit then, this was uh, the Liberty University case. Once again, the law was upheld. This was a pure Democratic uh, panel on that and uh, basically talked about the Anti Injunction Act. Viewed this as a tax, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Said, so, he thinks it's a tax. Under the Anti-Injunction uh, uh, Act, or Anti-Tax Injunction Act, you can't uh, you know, try to stop a tax before it actually gets implemented. So you're out of court for that purpose. The Fourth Circuit um, then also considered a very uh, prominent case in Virginia. Uh, Henry Hudson was a Republican, had struck down the law as unconstitutional. He did that before our case, but the Fourth Circuit then, uh, with the Democrat panel, upheld it, and basically though upheld it on a standing issue, and said so that Virginia was not didn't have a stake uh, in the fight because they didn't have standing. Uh, they didn't have the state individual mandate issue. That's really an individual. Uh, and interestingly, Virginia decided to go it alone. They decided not to join the other 26 states ultimately. First, we started out with 14 states. After the 2010 election, you know, a few more states joined in, and then uh, now we're at uh, we're 26 states. Uh, but Virginia never joined us because they wanted to go alone. 
and they wanted to do it because they had a state law that was passed before the health care legislation was passed. But while it was being debated, Virginia passed a law in the legislature saying, if any Virginian is compelled to buy a insurance product by any law anywhere on the planet, it's to hereby declared void against public policy and unconstitutional. And so they, they they wrote that horse to the Supreme Court and to, or to the uh, to the appellate court. The appellate court said, "You're out of state." Fortunately, we had uh, in our case we had only 26 states. We had uh, uh, two individuals plus the uh, Federation of Independent Businesses for associational standing as well, which is why and, and this is the only case that's been accepted by uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. Our case. Uh, all the other cases are just out there. They didn't accept cert on any of these other cases. We've got standing, we think, really sum it up. We've got 26 states, we've got the Federation Association standing, and then we've got uh, individuals who actually are business owners who do not want to purchase uh, health insurance. And so we think we, we're, we're fine on standing and never had a problem. And then uh, Roger, Roger Vincent struck down the laws unconstitutional. We'll see uh, his reasoning on that. And then a split panel here with the 11th Circuit was great. We went to Atlanta, we picked up a Clinton appointee. Uh, Frank Hall, who along with uh, Chief Judge uh, Davina, uh, decided that uh, Judge Vincent was correct and said the law is unconstitutional and, and affirmed it. Now there's going to be a slight difference, not slight difference, there's a big difference between those, those two opinions. Judge uh, Vincent said uh, it's unseverable. The individual mandate is unconstitutional and it's not severable. The whole law falls. Let the circuit said, yeah, you know, we've got to give a little more political deference to Congress. We're going to let the rest of the law stand. We'll just strike down the individual mandate, which of course drives the insurance companies crazy. Because how are they going to pay for all this, you know, pre-existing conditions and you know uh, all the uh, all the benefits under the uh, under the uh, law without a way to, to fund them? And so that's where we are right now. And, and with, with what's before the court right now, the Eleventh Circuit has struck down the individual mandate, individual mandate and said the rest of the provisions can, can stand. Which, as I said, I mean, if nothing else changes, all of our all of our premiums are going to go up, you know, ten thousand percent, you know, to cover those kind of benefits under the plan without the individual mandate. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk primarily about the uh, individual mandate, as I mentioned. But there are really four issues that the court's going to address. That the first issue really is: uh, is, is, is this a, is this is this tax a penalty? I'm going to give you some analysis on that from Judge Vincent in just a little while. But if it's a penalty, if if, if the penalty is a tax, if in fact you decide not to buy insurance that the government says you've got to buy with, this, with the details and the and the benefits and the characteristics that the government says you have to have now as an American citizen in your health insurance plan. If you choose not to do that, you have to pay a penalty. The question is whether that penalty is a tax. If it's a tax, then under the uh, uh, the uh, Anti-Injunction Act, you, you know, you're not even going to be able to have a case until until uh, 2014, which is when the tax will first be imposed. Um, nobody, I think maybe it was, uh, the, the Fourth Circuit, prior to that Fourth Circuit decision, no other court had said it was a tax. I think you'll see why with some of the some of the quotes that I'll, I'll give you here. If it's not a tax, then you got to you got to ask yourself: All right, is the individual mandate unconstitutional? And then the other challenge is: Is this expansion of Medicaid coercive? This was our this is the state's Tenth Amendment argument. We're saying, look, we're states, right? We got sovereign rights. We're going to run a federal system of government here. The federal government cannot come down and hand down these edicts and say, which is exactly what the law says, you've got to have a certain level of Medicaid funding. In Nevada, it means our Medicaid rules double overnight. They will double. They'll be about, the, 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 the conservative estimate is about $550 million impact on our budget, our state budget, over the first four years of this law because of the huge expansion of Medicaid. And what we argued to the, to the court was, this is coercion. And under Supreme Court precedent, the Supreme Court says, you, you know, federal government can, 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 can hand out initiative, or, uh, incentives, but they can't be coercive. We argued this clock goes across the line because you're requiring us to double our Medicaid rolls and take away all of our Medicaid funding as a state if we don't do it. So their argument always is, well, you know, you can always opt out of Medicaid. Well, they give us all of our Medicaid money back uh, as a state, but they don't do that. They take all your Medicaid money and they say, well, if you don't like this program, you can all opt out, which of course is absolutely impractical and crazy as, as a state. Um, so it's, it's uh, of course, one of the largest expenditures of states have. The other question they're going to ask is, uh, and by the way, we didn't win this one uh, with either Judge Benson or with the legislature. They both said, you know, there's a lot of things the federal government can do in encouraging states to do things. We don't think this crosses the line. So we've actually taken this up on appeal and asked the Supreme Court to, to reverse those, those decisions. The individual mandate is constitutional, and uh, uh, if it is, in fact, unconstitutional, then you've got to decide what's, what, 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 what survives and what doesn't. It's a sort of question. So those are the four points before, uh, before the Supreme Court. All right, so let's just uh, focus on, uh, for a minute, on the individual mandate. Uh, this has not been the first time. There's been about six efforts by the federal government since World War I to create a federal national health care system. Uh, and 
It wasn't until the Clinton administration that the federal government tried to do that by way of the individual mandate to require everybody to buy health insurance. So this started during the Clinton administration. You remember when uh, Hillary Clinton was so involved in that whole effort. Um, and this is, a, this is a memo then from the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office back then when it was being proposed, this individual mandate to cover health insurance for everybody. And this is a nonpartisan approach to this. A mandate requiring all individuals, all individuals to purchase health insurance would be unprecedented form of federal action. That's never happened before by everybody's account. The government has never required people to buy any good or service as a condition of lawful residence in the United States. Keep that in mind when you're talking about the arguments later on. Even the Congressional Budget Office says, you are asking people to buy a product just by their residence or citizenship in this country. An individual mandate would have two features that a combination may need. First, it would impose a duty on individuals as a member of society. You gotta do something just because you're a member of society. Second, it would require people to purchase a specific service that would be heavily regulated by the federal government. Never happened before. And then you may remember this famous uh, exchange. Uh, when Nancy Pelosi, the constitutional scholar that she is, was asked uh, by a news reporter, what, where, where specifically in the Constitution does Congress have the authority to enact an individual health insurance mandate? Remember she chided the reporter saying, are you serious, are you serious? I said, yes I am. And then her, uh, her uh, press uh, <coughs> spokesman butted in and said, you can put this on the record, that is not a serious question. That is not a serious question. Well, Judge, uh, Judge, Vincent, Judge Vincent and a lot of other judges thought otherwise. He said, uh, really, this case is not about health care. It's principally about our federalist system. And it raises important questions about the constitutional role of the federal government. And that's really what the focus has been. It has very little to do with health care. <clears throat> you can debate both sides of that equation. You can be on both sides of that issue. People, I think, have sincerely held beliefs in terms of whether we need reform, we don't need reform. But at its, at its core is this constitutional question about whether Congress has this authority. And, uh, and Everybody who's dealt with this has, has, has uh, in, in really an honest, straightforward manner, has dealt with the founding uh, fundamentals of our, of our uh, constitutional system of government. And, you, and we've all read this before. Look, if we've got angels governing us, we don't need any government. But we don't. We have men and women who govern us. And so we've got to have both external and internal controls on government. And that's what the Constitution is all about. And Congress occasionally needs to remember that they get all of their authority from Article One, right? It says, all your powers, all your hearing granted. Let's say whatever power in the world you can think of. Let's say whatever thing you want to do. It says, you've got powers, they're granted, you're in. And they're going to be vested in a House and a, and a Senate. That's the very fundamental uh, uh, principle that you have to uh, consider whenever, whenever Congress is passing anything. Okay? And then, of course, the, uh, Madison's uh, famous uh, comment, powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and, thought, few and defined, and the states have numerous and, and, and indefinite. Uh, uh, powers and, uh, and, and authority. And of course, that would be embodied by the 10th Amendment. And then in one of the, in one of the famous cases that we always uh, studied in law school, that those limits may, be, may not be mistaken or forgotten, the Constitution is written. And so when you have this attitude in Congress that we don't have to look at the Constitution, and you're just showboating when you want to read the Constitution, it is a complete fundamental misapprehension of our, uh, of our founding uh, as a country uh, to take that approach, which is so prevalent today. Okay, next. So. Nancy Pelosi had to, had to come up with a reason, you know, so, so she sends her secretary, her press secretary back out and says, uh, okay, well, let me, let me answer that question for you. Our power, our authority is under the Commerce Clause. So that's, that's the horse they're riding. That's the horse that they're riding. We're riding the Commerce Clause. Look, we can point to the Commerce Clause, and Congress shall have power to regulate commerce among the several states. That's the horse we're riding. And that's the horse they've been riding ever since we've been in court. Um, so let's just kind of talk about this. Now this is, this is the lawyer section, okay? This is, remember, going back to the constitutional law days uh, of, uh, of our Commerce Clause jurisprudence. I won't spend a ton of time on this, but I want to just kind of remind you and get it set up in terms of where we're at now, constitutionally speaking, for our laws as the Supreme Court considers this, uh, this, uh, this piece of legislation. There's no question that we all remember this. Remember that you know the cons were fighting and they were erecting trade barriers and they were charging each other to cross their borders and this was leading to not in conflict but out, 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 outright wars among the, uh, among the colonists and among the states. So one of the one of the main reasons that we went to Philadelphia was was a was a business commerce consideration. Uh, the founding fathers said we got to get this under control. We can't have states erecting these barriers uh, and causing all kinds of problems. We got to get unified on this. So one of the reasons that they went to Philadelphia was to solve this problem. And the Commerce Clause was put in there to solve this barrier uh, to, uh, to, to, to state uh, commerce. First 150 years, you may remember this, it was just really narrowly construed. Um, you can see I'm just spattered of these kind of uh, cases. 
you know, Congress didn't have any, any reach to, uh, you know, for, for manufacturing. Congress didn't have any, 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 any reach in the Commerce Clause, even if it, the manufacturing was a monopoly. Uh, Congress couldn't reach, uh, you know, uh, a, 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 a firing of an employee for union membership, even though it was an interstate carrier that was, a, that was, a, that was involved. Congress couldn't, uh, under, the, uh, under, the, under the Commerce Clause, even prohibit goods that were produced by child labor. Congress couldn't, you know, extend regulations of wages and hour and conditions for coal miners, even though uh, they, were, they could clearly uh, work in, in, and affected uh, business across uh, state lines. So it was very narrowly construed for the, for, for the first 150 years. Then FDR's up, and everything changes with FDR. Pretty much, you can you, you can you can pretty much track back to FDR uh, a lot of our challenges with our constitutional uh, system right now. Three new bill cases. So, as we all know, FDR and uh, the Congress created uh, an awful lot of legislation in the Depression, and he was going to ensure that the Supreme Court was going to ensure that those, uh, that legislation was upheld. And this then is where you begin to see the substantial effects or substantial impact uh, language by the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court now, in the Lawson Steel case said, you can regulate even purely interstate, just in-state uh, activities if it has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. That was the first big leap in 37 uh, under that case. Uh, the, the Darby case, same sort of thing. Now we can, now we can, we can regulate wage and hour laws because that has this substantial impact. And this is always the famous case that we study in, in law school. Remember that Wickard thing, Wickard versus Billborn case. Remember poor, uh, you know, poor uh, farmer uh, Philburn. All he wanted to do was grow a little wheat for his farm, and uh, an FDR and the administration was concerned about wheat prices. And so they put a limit on every farmer in the country as to how much wheat you could grow. And, uh, and it was the Agricultural Adjustment Act of, of 1938. Well, Mr. Filburn, Farmer Filburn, uh, had 12 acres. And, and he grew his 12 acres of, of wheat. And then next to it, he grew some more acreage just for his own farm use. He fed it to his chickens and his pigs and his wife baked bread with it and they would, you know, use it for their own consumption. They didn't sell it anything, just on the farm. Well, he was then uh, penalized under that act. He, uh, he appeals it and the Supreme Court then says, no, this will have a substantial, you growing this wheat, for your own personal consumption will have a substantial effect on interstate commerce because this is when the aggregate principle now was, 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 was invoked. Taken together, if everybody across the country does this, it's gonna have a substantial impact on interstate commerce. So we can regulate you. We can keep you from growing an acre or two on your farm for your own private consumption under the Commerce Clause. And uh, from that point forward, actually from uh, Laughlin still forward, it was not until 1995 that the Supreme Court would strike down a law that Congress passed under the Commerce Clause because it had exceeded its authority. Mm -hmm. Then comes the United States versus Lopez. This was the uh, Gun Free Zone Act of 1990. This is basically a law that says, good idea, you can't carry a gun within a thousand feet of a school zone. Lopez is convicted of that. He appeals it, says this is, this is beyond the Commerce Clause. Uh, authority of Congress because that's what they used in order to pass the law. And for the first time in 60 years, the U.S. Supreme Court strikes it down and says, yeah, this is too much. And it is significant uh, because of the language and, 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 and some of the facts in the case that they conceded to recognize. They said, look, all the Commerce Clause decisions have some outer limit. It's not, it's not limitless. Um, you could, if, if you don't have some sort of limit, you would just obliterate the, obliterate the, obliterate the distinction between national, local, and creating a completely centralized government. And they can see it. Hey, we can see gun violence is a natural problem. We're going to hear these kind of arguments again with the healthcare uh, legislation. It's a national problem. It can be an, an adverse effect in the classroom. It's going to decrease productivity. It's going to discourage travel into areas that are unsafe. And it's a substantial threat to interstate commerce. They recognized all that. They conceded it. They said, but if, 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 if that were accepted as why we could regulate, then it's difficult to perceive any limit on federal power. For the first time, the courts begin to say, we do have a constitutional system of government here. You know, and there are limits to what the federal government can do. We have to recognize those. And if we're not careful, the Commerce Clause is gonna swallow everything. We're hard pressed to pause any activity by an individual that Congress is without power to regulate if we let them do this. So, Lopez strikes back finally. If you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna accept the argument, you have to pile inference upon inference. It can work congressional authority of the Commerce Clause, basically general police power, which is always the state enjoyed. To, to protect their health, safety, and welfare of their, of their citizens. It's always what the states had. We would convert that to a general police power. Admittedly, some of our prior, this admittedly, some of our prior cases have taken long steps down that road, giving great deference to congressional action. The broad language of these opinions suggests the possibility of additional expansion. 
But we need to climb here to proceed any further. Thank Abbott. Now, if I put the brakes on this thing, to do so requires to conclude that the Constitution's enumerated powers did not presuppose something not enumerated, and that there never will be a distinction between what is truly national and what is truly local. This we are unwilling to do, and people were, conservatives were happy about this decision. And they were happy about the next decision, which came out. Well, yeah, before I get there, let me go to, let me go to, who's going to, what, what, what's the answer to this question? You all know the answer, right? Kennedy's going to, right? Kennedy's a swing. You got, in this, in this Supreme Court environment, you've got Scalia, Thomas, Roberts, and Alito. Those are four. And how many do you have to count to when you're going to the Supreme Court? Five. You've got to get one more. And the only chance you got is Kennedy. Concurring in Lopez, this is what Kennedy says. It is the duty of the court to recognize meaningful limits on the Congress power and to intervene if Congress has tipped the scales too far as federal balance is too essential a part of our constitutional structure and plays too vital a role in securing freedom. That's the purpose of our constitutional form of government. Our founding fathers said a long time ago, if you want an efficient government, we already have efficient government. His name's King George III. It's a great efficient government. You want a dictator, you want a king, you want a tyrant, you want a dictator. Those are very efficient forms of government. We don't want them. What we want is freedom. We want liberty. We want to curtail the power of government. So we're establishing a different and experimental system of government now, and we're dividing powers horizontally and vertically. Three separations of the, of, of the separations of power and, 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 uh, and vertically with the states and the federal government. And that's basically what they said. This system plays too vital a role in securing our freedoms. So when somebody says, as I told my scouts this summer, when somebody stands up on national television and tells you that they want to fundamentally change our system of government, you better step back and you better take a long and hard look at that because that system of government has established and guaranteed our freedoms for over 200 years. And it's what allows you all to have the opportunities and blessings of going home tonight and living in a comfortable surroundings and having a full belly. All right, next case, Morrison, same thing. It was, it was, it was, it was just a, a building on Lopez. This was the Violence Against Women Act of 94. The theory was that Congress said, hey, we can regulate this gender motivated violence because victims are deterred from traveling interstate business or employment, which substantially affects interstate commerce. The court rejected that reasoning and uh, started with uh, the founding principles, which we, we've got to look at the limits. What, 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 what authority does Congress have? Every law enacted by Congress must be based on one or more of its powers enumerated in the Constitution. And there are those in Congress today who mock that, continually mock that. Even when you bring that up, they think it's a silly suggestion. The statute didn't regulate economic activity as required by the Commerce Clause. Gender motivated crimes and violence are not, in any sense of the phrase, economic activity. Thus far in our nation's history, our cases have upheld Commerce Clause regulations of interstate activity only where there's activities economic in nature. And the court had to file for its own inference, which it said it wasn't willing to do, and uh, we completely obliterate national and local authority. So we're all feeling pretty good after Lopez and, and Morrison finally, you know, some, some sanity coming back to the court. Uh, and then a very strange case comes down called Gonzalez versus Reich in uh, 2005. You may remember this case. This is where California passed their medical marijuana statute, which allowed you to grow marijuana for, for your own use, your own home consumption, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, Gonzalez was, was, was convicted uh, under the uh, federal <coughs> The, uh, the Controlled Substance Act of 1970, and said uh, this is this is outside of Congress's authority. Not only that, I'm, I'm, I'm consistent with state law because state law allows this. Uh, and and the uh, uh, and, and 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 I never I buy it and sell it. Never cross state line. I'm just growing it here in my little you know greenhouse that I can harvest and I smoke it because I I can I can get some relief for that. The court said uh, our case law firmly establishes Congress's power to regulate purely local activities as a part of an economic class activities that have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And the court went back to Wicker in a lot of ways. Production of the commodity meant for home consumption, be it wheat or marijuana, has a substantial effect on supply and demand in the national market for that commodity. So that's where we are. Now, that, that's, that's the state of the law right now. That's what the Supreme Court has. So of course, you know what we're emphasizing, the states. I mean, look at it. Lopez and Morrison makes this case easy. Right? Uh, and of course, the federal government said, we'll take a look at Wickard and Wright. It, it's clearly within our, within our wheelhouse. We clearly have this authority. And Judge uh, Vincent uh, said, you know, that's, that's not really the way I look at it. He said, while these cases frame the analysis, and it's good to look at it from a historical perspective, it doesn't really get uh, in, in the question. 
says because everybody associated with Congress who's uh, impartial has advised them that the act was before it's passed the law, that uh, this idea of under the Commerce Clause directly imposing individual mandate to purchase health care insurance is novel and unprecedented. Essentially, Judge Witt said, we've never had this happen before in the nation's history. So while it's guidance, uh, it's not just positive at, at, any, at any level. So, we're just going to just walk you through uh, what, what, what the judge did. You doing okay, time? Okay. Um, <coughs> so, you're going to let me, let me this, this is kind of take, takes us through, you know, Congress never, never required this before. The individual mandate is different from Wicker and Wright, he's distinguishing those cases, because the individual, this will be very important in terms of what he's going to rule and, and what the question for the court is, because the individuals being regulated in those cases were engaged in, in, in an activity. And each had the choice to discontinue that activity and avoid penalty. Every, com every prior cars, uh, commerce clause place had a clear and inarguable activity. This is great. He said, look, it would just be a radical departure from existing case law if you said that Congress can regulate inactivity. And the way he characterized it was to say, this is not activity. You're not, you're not growing wheat. You're not growing marijuana. You're not, um, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not you know, selling goods. You're not manufacturing goods. You are simply being a citizen, a member of society. And the government is imposing upon you now an obligation to go buy something. That's never happened before. That's not activity. That's just, that's really inactivity. I don't want to do anything. And they said, which I thought was great. <clears throat> this is one of the great lines of his opinion. I think one of the great lines of all times. It is difficult to imagine that a nation which began, at least in part, as the result of opposition to a British mandate, giving the East India Company a monopoly and imposing a nominal tax on all tea sold in America, would have set out to create a government with the power to force people to buy tea in the first place. <laughs> Do you love Judge Benson? I mean, you just got to go home and just think our God in heaven every night that you have people who are still thinking this way. If Congress can penalize a passive individual for failing to engage in commerce, the enumeration of powers in the Constitution would have been in vain, for it would be difficult to perceive any limitation on federal power, and we would have a Constitution name only. Surely, this is not what the Founding Fathers could have intended. Now, just very quickly on the severability analysis, he said there was a severability clause, and you'll appreciate this from your legal training, there initially was a severability clause uh, in, the, in the Act, but then the final version, it was out. It had been taken out and removed by Congress. So the judge went through a long, a long analysis, but he says basically the individual mandate is indisputably necessary to tax the insurance market reform. The Congress has said that, everybody said it. The reason we've got to have this individual mandate is to fund this national health care. And he says it's indisputably necessary to the purpose of the act. So it's all going to It's all going to fall. Because like, I can't unwind it. Now let's get this real quick thing. The tax analysis is still so funny. We won this on a motion to dismiss. Because if the government brought a motion at the very beginning of the case and said, Get these states out of here. This penalty is a tax. And we have broad authority under the, under the Constitution under the spending tax clause. This is a tax. And then, the, and then the judge went back and basically shoved down the Department of Justice's throat with all the statements that their bosses had made when the, the, when, when the legislation had been passed. Remember President Obama's public position is not a penalty. George Stephanopoulos breaks out a, uh, a dictionary to define tax. Remember that? He says, you're reaching, George. You know, this isn't a tax. Congress's position clearly was that this isn't, a, this isn't a tax. Why? Because the political environment, they had promised not to raise taxes, including President Obama. And then this is what Judge Vincent said. Congress should not be permitted to secure and cast politically difficult votes on controversial legislation by deliberately calling someone something one thing, after which the defenders of that legislation take an Alice in Wonderland tack and argue in court that Congress really meant something entirely different, thereby circumventing the safeguards that exist to keep that broad power in check. And then he went to gone to quote Humpty Dumpty, in, uh, in Alice in Wonderland, that, uh, that I, can, I can make words mean whatever I want them to be. All right, now let me just give you, let me give you a contrast. So that sets you up with Judge Benson and, and where we're at with Judge Benson and the district court decision currently not before the Supreme Court. Now, this side, uh, can you just go back on that? Uh, just want to look up there, um, reset. So this was, I, I told you we talked about uh, Gladys Kaiser, Kessler. Uh, she was from the DC Circuit. She determined that the, that the individual mandate was constitutional, as have several others. But this is how she's got to get there. You think about this. This is how she's got to get there. She acknowledges that Congress can only regulate an activity. That's a problem. That's a problem under the statute. They all regular, recognize that activity is what's regulated. But decision making constitutes activity. Here's how, she, here's how she gets there. As previous Commerce Clause cases have all involved physical activity, growing weed, selling something, manufacturing something, whatever, as opposed to mental activity. So she recognizes 
Everything in those prior cases dealt with physical activity. People were doing something, actually, as opposed to this thinking, right? There's little judicial guidance on whether the latter falls within Congress's power. Have you lost your mind? Are we actually saying now that you're actually, somebody is seriously thinking, and I'm telling you, a lot of people are seriously thinking, the decision making now, let's, huh, let's think about this. We don't have a lot of Supreme Court guidance, so let's think about whether decision making falls within the Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. And so she says, you know, I, I'm hearing all your arguments that you're making, but this, you know, we, I, I find the distinction with their, you guys are relying on very heavily to give little significance. It is a pure semantics to argue that the individual who makes his choice for affordable health insurance is not acting, especially given the uh, serious economic and health related consequences to every individual that choice. Making a choice is an affirmative action whether one decides to do something or not to do something. They are two sides of the same coin. To pretend otherwise is to ignore reality. And she upheld the law and said, it's activity because you're thinking about it and you've thought about your decision and I'm going to govern choice making. So, application of mental activity and decision making is within Congress' authority to regulate activities under the Congress clause. There's a decision out there that says that. Even though, uh, <laughs> now, so we get to the 11th Circuit, take up Judge Fitz's uh, uh, decision. We got Davina, <coughs> Paul, and Marcus on our panel. And they, uh, they, they say, as an initial matter, they take a little swipe at, uh, they take a little swipe at uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi. As an initial matter, to know whether a legislative act is constitutional requires knowing what is in the act. <laughs> <laughs> According to our task, we'll figure out what this sweeping comprehension, comprehensive act actually says and does. They go for a similar reason to re reason Judge Benson. They conclude that the individual mandate is not constitutional, it's not within the Congress's enumerated power. And they say, but there's a whole lot of things Congress can regulate. You know, we're not diminishing that, regula re that regulatory authority under the Congress clause. They can regulate all kinds of things. They can give pages of the example that they can regulate. But what Congress cannot do under the Congress clause is mandate that individuals enter into contracts with private insurance companies for the purchase of an expensive product from the time they are born until the time they die. Severability, they, they rejected his, his analysis. They said, you know what, we can sever it. Uh, and we think we read the ability to under the, under the separation of powers and respect for Congress. So they, they do that, so many provisions are back. <coughs> now, what's it, this is at the, at the US Supreme Court. <coughs> just a, a couple of quotes here, just to kind of put in, in, in perspective what we've argued. But you know, the individual mandate rests in this, this, this federal power. It's unprecedented, it's unbounded. Um, to assert this power, this is certain powers that exist. If Congress really had this remarkable authority, it wouldn't have waited 220 years to exercise it. We're just now finding out that they can require Americans to buy products. We've gone through depressions and world wars and everything else, and they already exercised it. If this power really existed, both our constitutional and our constitutional history would look fundamentally different. We would not have a federal government with limited enumerated powers or states that continue to enjoy dignity and residual sovereignty. This extraordinary power that the federal government claims here is simply the power of our government. So we are uh, in oral, we're at oral argument. Generally, uh, each side gets uh, 30 minutes apiece. The judges, uh, the justices uh, allocated an unprecedented five and a half hours over three days. Uh, the Anti-Injunction Act will get 90 minutes. That was a little surprising too. The, the justices want to know, is this tabs or not? They want to give everybody enough time to, to argue it. Individual mandate will get 90 minutes, severability 90 minutes, and then our 10th Amendment Medicaid uh, course of argument will get 60 minutes. There's been very few cases that have ever had more than four hours since World War II. Just to give you a comparison, you may have heard of a little case called Bush versus Gore back in 2000. Uh, that was a consolidation of several cases. That got 90 minutes. This, this, this uh, big, huge uh, political case, Citizens United, got less than 90 minutes. And that, 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 tells you, I mean, that, that tells you how significant this is, and it tells you how wrong and how misguided the people who said, this is clearly within Congress's authority and, 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 um, and uh, enumerated powers. Uh, so don't even join that lawsuit. You know that was that was that, 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 that was that was a little echoing of our attorney general at the time when Jim Gibbons asked her, "Hey, join this lawsuit." Are you kidding me? This is clearly constitutional, clearly within Congress's authority. I mean, it basically would be a frivolous lawsuit for me to join this. You know, in essence, what she was saying: five and a half hours, unprecedented oral argument time before the Supreme Court to deal with this. You know, case that really warning his attention. So I'll, I'll leave with this: one of my favorite quotes from uh, Ronald Reagan. Who made this when there was another effort to uh, uh, to uh, roll out some uh, some healthcare issues? He said, "Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like to live in the United States, where men were free." Thanks very much.
I'll, I'll give you one interesting follow-up on that, Mike, which is somebody may ask, well, what about the right decision, you know, the, the, the marijuana case? Where was Kennedy in that? He was in the majority. So, it was, it was, but, 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 but he didn't author a concurring opinion, which is why we, uh, we like, uh, you know, we like his, his concurring opinion in Lopez. But, yeah, just like Niall's saying, I mean, he's the swing, you know, he's going to be the swing. We got we to get him. We hope, he's, we hope he's more Lopez than he is right, you know? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Randy Barnett spoke at the law school last year. He said that he thought a single payer system. He thought he said yeah. a single payer system would actually be more constitutional than this. Do you agree with it? Uh, a single payer system would be completely constitutional if it was based on our general tax uh, revenue. Sure. Well, I mean, yeah, you could. You could have. That's what they do in England, right? Uh, they just have a complete national system. Comes out of the general um, general budget, and that's taxes and spending, and completely constitutional. Yep. But it may be a little more difficult to get that on politically. Which is why they had to go to the new mandate. They had to do it twice. You know, they, like I said, since World War One, there's been six efforts to make a national health care fly. They've been unsuccessful, and now this, these last two go-arounds have been. Well, we'll try with the new mandate now. Yes, sir. I wonder if there isn't a freedom of religion argument furrowed into all of this. There's some religions yes. that do not uh, cotton to medical care. That's right. So in essence, you'd be making people pay. Or medical insurance, which they would never use. Exactly. There's already been cases that have been filed on that, and uh, and uh, uh, the courts have upheld those uh, challenges. And the courts not accepted cert on any of those. But yes, but that challenge has been made. It's a First Amendment issue. I don't want I don't want health care. So it's, it's against my religious values. And in fact, though, there is an opt out under the uh, under the uh, legislation for uh, uh, for uh, religious objections or oh, consideration. Okay, thank you. But there has been actually that challenge as well. Yes, sir. Um, there, there's a part of the briefing anywhere that if you can rec there's really not, not, no activity you can do sitting out here eating big no. plates full of red meat. No, that's right. That doesn't fall under the idea of health care. No, that's right. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, I mean, Congress can regulate that. Congress can regulate how many slices of meat you're going to eat at lunch. It's just so easy for them to do that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to affect your health care. Uh, and, 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 and in the aggregate, if you're under, if you're under a wicked analysis and a right analysis, if you go out and eat all this meat, you know, it's going to have an impact on health care. We're paying for health care. It's going to have an impact on the interstate commerce. Yeah. It never ends. It never ends. I mean, who was talking about it? They can decide. It would be very easy for Congress to regulate when we turn off the lights at night or when we go to bed at night because we'll use less electricity, right? We turn off our lights at 7 o'clock instead of 9 o'clock. <clears throat> less activity. Um, we can regulate activity. In fact, I, even, I, I can regulate even when you're thinking about your activity. When you're thinking about turning off that light. Don't even think about it. I'm tell you when to turn it off. Because I'm going to regulate your thought making pro your, your thought uh, and, and decision making process because, that's, because your choice will have an effect on interstate commerce. Yes, sir. Um, if you think the court would go down and strike the individual mandate, do you think they'd be more likely just to strike that portion of the law, or be more likely to overturn the law at all? I think, uh, so, so the question is, what do we think will happen if they strike down the new mandate? Would they then go on to strike down the rest of the law, which is what Judge Vincent did, or would they just say the rest of the law can stand, which is what the 11th Circuit did? My own, my own feeling is they would do more what the 11th Circuit did, just because they tend to do that. They want to be as circumspect as possible. They want to be as careful, you know, based on uh, separation of powers, and they want to do the least intrusive uh, uh, ruling uh, to Congress's uh, intent and, uh, and, and, and decision making. So I would, I would say that they would be more inclined to do that. But I will tell you, the Judge Vincent's decision is incredibly good in terms of the legal analysis. When you go through, and we've all, you know, we've all talked about and evaluated severability issues in our own practices. When you go through the analysis, he's dead on right. What the 11th Circuit did and what the Supreme Court may or may not do is take the more policy-grounded approach and say, you know, in our, in, our, in our separation of powers and in our respect for other branches of government, uh, should we do something different? Yes, sir. Is there any chance they won't publish until after the election? Uh, we will have a decision uh, by the end of June because that's when the uh, Supreme Court's terms ends. So by, by the end of June of this year, we'll have a decision. Oh, yeah, this will be this will be an election year decision, and it'll have major repercussions on it. Yep. And it's, it, there's actually is that your question too? No. Is the thinking that if only the mandate is struck down, the rest of the law would be so unpalatable yeah, that yeah. they're forced to overturn it? Right. So the, right. So the thinking is, if in fact the individual mandate is, is is just struck down and the rest of the provisions remain. The Congress will have to do something. That's exactly right. There, there's just no way that that mammoth law, with all of those benefits and all of those burdens on the insurance companies and on uh, everybody else, will uh, will stand. It's just because the, the, now you got to find a way to to, uh, to uh, uh, pay for it. If you don't spread it out over a bunch of healthy people and take care of all these people, uh, you can't do it.
Okay. Yep. Other questions? Perfect. What, what do you think about the political and legal ramifications of what's been the news lately oh. with the birth control right. and the religious based arguments? Great question. You know, what, uh, you know, what's uh, kind of the view here on this uh, First Amendment um, pushback uh, based on the uh, health care legis legislation? First, I think it is a direct result of passing the law to know what's in the law. Uh, you got a lot of gov uh, senators and, and, and uh, congressmen now who are feigning surprise. Uh, that, well, I had no idea that was the law. Well, no kidding, you didn't read the act. And now your constituents are up in arms, and now you're in trouble because you supported the act because you didn't read what was in the act. So point one is, you, you know, if you're a politician, you probably ought to read an act before you, before you sign on to it. At least have a summary or something, you know, something you know what's in the act. But secondly, I think people really begin to understand that this is a massive uh, encroachment on our, on our freedoms and our individual rights. The Constitution is created, was created. Our founding fathers were so forceful, for they were way ahead of their time to keep liberty and freedom at its, uh, at its apex in our system of government. We have to divide and conquer government. And, uh, and I think people are beginning to see now this encroachment on our First Amendment rights. You know, we never intend our government to be able to do that. Uh, the encroachment on our, on, our, on our decisions and the most intimate, private uh, uh, issues in our lives. We never intend the government to, to, to do that. And as we let the government creep in, and we let the centralized, huge, uh, efficient government uh, do the job for us, that's exactly what happens. You know, that's exactly what happens. We've got dictators and kings and tyrants ruling you. Wonderful system of government. <clears throat> Things get done. Trains run on time. Uh, but this is, you know, the poor people have uh, have the rights trampled. Okay. Thank you very much.